All right, to start out today, I want you to think of a time when you felt like a fish out of water. You know that, that, that expression. Um, maybe it was at a, a dinner or maybe it was at a party of some kind, maybe a, a family reunion or some other celebration, but uh, where you felt out of place. And, and for me, this is a very familiar feeling. I, I feel it a lot. Um, in fact, a while back, I was sitting next to Kathy St. Clair, who was here today, and we were sitting at a wedding reception, and we were comparing notes of who felt the most like a fish out of water. Isn't that right, Kathy? Uh, so here's the, here's the question that I want you to either write a YouTube live comment or else text Andrew on. Uh, when did you feel like a fish out of water. See, if we were all together as a church, I'd just have you shout out the answers, but we can't do that. So we're going to take uh, three minutes, and you can tell it to people you are with in your house church or, or here in the office, but then I also want you to put it into a comment so uh, Andrew, will, Andrew will read the ones that you text him. I've got my phone here, and I can see the, uh, the YouTube live comments, and so we'll read those. When did you feel like a fish out of water, okay? Three minutes, here we go. All right, very good. I'm sure you had some good discussion here. Let me read some of the comments I got. Hey, hi, hi to Juan, by the way, down in uh, Mexico. Hey Juan, I'm supposed to ask you um, when you can preach for us. I mean, you're on here all the time anyway, so you might as well just preach. So think about that, and you and I will talk later, all right? Karen DeGraff, she says, hi, oh, hi from an underground church, oh my. Jonathan Martin, we had fun dancing with grandkids in worship. Well, hey, that's pretty cool. Says thanks, Eric. All right, uh, let's see, I gotta come down to, oh, uh, Carrie, Carrie Cooley, he's chromouflage. Oh, oh, this is Carissa saying, entire high school, she felt like a fish out of water. <laughs> All right, George uh, Perkins says, first day of Marine Corps boot camp, I, I bet. Uh, Velvet Cooley says, as a Head Start director. I can only imagine what that's like. Mm -hmm. Becky Torgerson, when we moved to a very small town in central Iowa. Now, I, I wouldn't mind that. That sounds pretty good to me. Jonathan Martin, this is, for, or this is from Janie when I am with people in conversation that I don't know anything about. Cody Porter, hi there Cody, nice to see you guys. Uh, Gordon and Cindy, when, Cindy says, when I moved to Colorado. Yeah, that was a, a big change. Uh, Kerry Cooley, he was at a climate change conference in London. Oh boy. <laughs> <laughs> the McLaughlin's moving up to Oregon to go to college, didn't know anyone. Uh, Jeremy and Kimberly, being an American in the Philippines uh, for Jeremy and being a Filipino in America for Kimberly. Oh, that's great. Kimberly, hope your uh, pregnancy, give us a comment. Is pregnancy going okay? Been praying for you and uh, really excited for you guys. My wife says when we landed in the village of Galena, Alaska in 1980. Yep, she did. She did great though. Cody Porter, going to a new school where I only knew a couple students. Jonathan Martin, where when I can't find anything in common with the, with the person I'm with. Juan, first day of high school, yep. Norm Phillips, <laughs> Norm is a teacher and he said all of middle school. <laughs> <laughs> Steve Fromm, first day of high school in a new city coming from a small town. Um, J.M. Wood, my growing up years. Bonnie Maddox, starting OSU without a roommate. Oh, that would be different. Um, Nancy Perkins, when I, when, when I don't, oh, when don't I feel like a fish out of water? Okay. Now, we kind of said the same thing here, Nancy, several of us. Uh, first days in Vietnam for Gary Wood. Um, all of middle and high school from Dara Martin, boy, that's for sure. Uh, and Juan says yes to preaching. All right, we'll just got to find a date for you, Juan. That'll be fun. What do you got, Andrew? Um, Greg Moffat says attending a couple's baby shower, which <laughs> sounds absolutely interesting. And Joel Moffat says he was the only boy leader at a school open house, and he had to go on stage and talk with 10 girls. And that felt like a fish out of water to him. Um, an unknown person says, in my Spanish class. Mm -hmm. um, 
uh, Dean and Pat say, feel like a fish out of water in the present circumstances we are in and not being able to do anything about it. Boy, yeah. Um, uh, Tracy Cat says, attending a language institute in Oaxaca, Mexico, and had to rely on a dictionary and the kindness of strangers to get around town. Lindsay Arnold says, I was supposed to pray with people at a free health clinic, but all of the patients only spoke Spanish, and I <laughs> don't speak Spanish. Andy Wilson says, high school. Uh -huh. um, Kimberly Stegner says, gym class. Mm. So that's uh, relatable. And that is all I have. All right. Well, well done. Hey, uh, before you leave, tell us about what's going on right after this. Yeah. Afterwards, we are going to be in here at the church office, and we are going to be having a young adults group where um, people from the age of 18 to like 24, 25 are just going to meet, and we're going to get into scripture and pray for one another and just have conversations about how our week's going. We're going to break bread and share a time of fellowship. I'm pretty excited. Have that. So what's for lunch today? I think we're going to do pizza. All right. Yeah. Sounds good. For sure. All right. Thanks, Thanks Andrew. Andrew. Thanks for your help. Well, this morning in our study of the life of Jesus, uh, we're going to come to a situation where Jesus should have felt like a fish out of water. Most of us who, if we had been there, would have certainly felt uncomfortable. Uh, Jesus and his disciples attended an event where the hosts, the host and the guests were just not the kind of people that you would expect a religious leader like a rabbi and his followers to hang around. And I, I hope as we see Jesus' situation and we hear the criticism that he got for showing up at this event, so I, I hope we can, can gain some perspective, um, a little perspective on on. All of the stuff that has been going on around us the last several weeks. You think about all the groups, all the, the factions, and, and all the uh, crises and the institutions that have been in the news. Would, how would Jesus have felt in any of those groups? And would he have been part of, of any of those scenes? Um, just a question. Just a question. Think about that. I'm not going to try to persuade you one way or the other whether he should have been in this group or that group or, or whatever. But we're going to pick up the narrative in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 9, if you have a Bible with you. Uh, last week, we, uh, Jonathan took us uh, across the Sea of Galilee, actually. He went, we went south, uh, would be southeast, across the Sea of Galilee. And, and of course, they got in a big storm as they were going across the, the sea and Jonathan reminded us, great reminder, that Jesus is not only aware of any crisis that we're in, but he is also in the crisis with us. Uh, he talked about the, the airplane. Did you think about that all week? I thought about this all week, this airplane analogy that, that God is the pilot. He, he's directing where this airplane is, is going to go, but Jesus walks on, he boards the airplane, and he sits down next to us. So he's with us. It's, it's like God the Father and Jesus and the Spirit are all right there. That image has been with me all week, so thank you, Jonathan, for that. So we ended up last Sunday with Jesus and his disciples still on the southeast side of the Sea of Galilee uh, in an area called the Gadarenes. And, and there Jesus, that's where Jesus had cast demons out of a couple men and uh, those, he commanded the demons to go into the pigs and the pigs ran into the water and drowned like lemmings. And when the Gentile pig farmers saw what had happened to their, their livelihood, they begged Jesus just to leave, just go away, please. And uh, so we get to, to uh, chapter nine, verse one, Jesus is leaving and it says, and getting into a boat, he crossed over, again, this time heading mostly north, and came to his own city. This would be Capernaum, Jesus' base uh, in, in Galilee. His base was not Nazareth, his, his birth town, or not his birth town, but where he grew up, but Capernaum. In Capernaum, Jesus and his disciples stayed at Peter's home. And behold, some people brought to him a paralytic, now, Matthew leaves out some great details to this story that Mark puts in. So I want to look at Mark's account. Here's what Mark wrote. And they came, bringing to him a paralytic carried by four men. And when they could not get near him because of the crowd, they removed the roof above him 
And when they had made an opening, they let down the bed on which the paralytic lay. Now you remember this story from Sunday school. It's, it's one of our favorites. There's, so, and, and a severely disabled person in Bible times was really at a disadvantage. There was hardly any way to get around. They had no mobility. There's no wheelchairs or no battery powered scooters they could ride, no handicapped parking spaces or gentle ramps to get up into buildings. Uh, and, and so this, these, this man's friends felt sorry for him and they carried him on a bed or on a stretcher and they come up to where Jesus is, is speaking and they can't get through. There's just a crowd of people. So they go up what was, what was probably an outside stairway and when they get up on the roof, they dismantled some of the roof so they could lower this man down to where Jesus were, was. And what Jesus saw in their actions was, was not just desperation. Look at the second part of Matthew chapter 9, verse 2. It says, and when Jesus saw their faith, he saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, take heart. Now, we've noted before that faith was, was not an essential prerequisite to whether Jesus healed someone. But whenever you find, whenever we see faith, Jesus affirms it. He, he mentions it. Uh, faith is significant here because the Pharisees taught that all long-term disabilities or all long-term illnesses were automatic. They were God's punishment for sin. And they got it out of the law of Moses, so they weren't all wrong. De Deuteronomy 28 says, If you refuse to listen to the Lord your God and do not obey all the commands, your towns and your fields will be cursed. The Lord will afflict you with diseases until none of you are left. The Lord will strike you down with wasting diseases, fever and inflammation. So, so it was in the law that God sometimes used serious things to convict people of sin and to get them to change. And, and physical infirmities are listed, uh, linked to sin in the New Testament as well. Uh, Paul warned around about taking communion uh, without first confessing sin. Now this paralyzed man uh, may not have known which sin caused his paralysis or even whose sin because it could be a family member's sin or it could even be generational sin of an ancestor. But this guy, he, he apparently believed um, that, that his paralysis was from God. It was payback somehow. What a thing to have to live with. Think about that. Um, I mean, you get out of line with God and, boom, you know, it's whack-a-mole. Divine whack-a-mole. God's going to whack you if you get out of line. You know, that preaches really easily. And, and it, is, it is an effective way to, to control people's behavior sometimes. Some of you grew up in churches where God's going to get you for that was a was a, a, a main theme that was preached a lot. And as we said a couple weeks ago, it's always good to ask, is this hardship, is this physical problem, or are the life circumstances that are going sideways for me, are they, could they be connected in any way to some correction of God? But God has many, many more purposes for sicknesses and hardship than just whacking, than just punishment. Um, Paul the Apostle, here, here's some verses that show where Paul's talking about the thorn in the flesh that he had. Remember that? Uh, and uh, this, the Bible says this thorn in the flesh was given to him by Satan. Satan afflicted Paul with some kind of a, a painful ailment of some kind. And Paul prayed that God would take it away. And what's fascinating is God's response. You would think that if there's anything God would love to do, it would be to reverse something that, that Satan had done to one of his servants. But God says, no, no, Paul, actually, I think I want you to keep it. I think it'll keep you. Let's have you keep it. I want your pain to be a constant reminder that you are weak and, and I am strong, God says. So Paul lived with that. Now, on the other hand, Everything in Matthew 9 in this story seems to indicate that this man's paralysis was somehow connected to, to sin. Verse 2 again, And behold, some people brought to him a paralytic lying on a bed. And when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Take heart, my son, 
your sins are forgiven. And behold, some of the scribes said to themselves, this man is blaspheming. Now, blasphemy in their minds was, was anything that insulted God. And certainly it was insulting to God for Jesus the rabbi to say that he had the power to forgive sins in their minds. Verse 4. But Jesus, knowing their thoughts, <clears throat> said, why do you think evil in your hearts? Now, this had to be so frustrating for Jesus' opponents. Can you imagine debating someone who always knew what your next argument was going to be. Uh, the, and Jesus is, is interacting here with, with scribes. They're the lawyers. And they're skilled at, at reasoned arguments. And, and just when they get ready to say something, Jesus refutes their argument before they could give him and give them. And, and not only that, he called out their motives. Imagine having a friend or a spouse, or, or somebody who always knows exactly what you're thinking and why you're thinking it. Wow. Jesus said, why do you think evil in your hearts? Which is easier to say, your sins are forgiven, or to say, rise and walk? Now, two miracles have just taken place in this man. Uh, his sins have been forgiven. That is a huge miracle. But that miracle was invisible. Jesus continued in verse 6, But that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, he said to the paralytic, Rise, pick up your bed, and go home. And he rose and went home. Well, nobody could deny what they had just seen. They, they all just saw it with their eyes. And by doing the impossible, Jesus claimed for himself the messianic title, Son of Man. And there was nothing that the scribes could say. No argument they could give. So they are seething inside with, with anger. Well, verse 8 says, when the crowd saw it, they were, they were afraid. Some translations say they were filled with awe. But it's, it's really more than, than just admiration. When you come face to face with the awesome power of God. There is a fear factor built in, along with the reverence and, and the respect. They, they were afraid, and they glorified God, who had given such authority to men. The word is anthropos, humans, men and women. So not only have the, the religious leaders witnessed this miracle that they cannot deny, but now they've been embarrassed in front of this, this large crowd. And if there's anything a scribe or a Pharisee doesn't like, it's being embarrassed in front of the people that are supposed to do whatever they say. But when someone is confronted with irrefutable evidence, they have to either accept the evidence and change their mind, or the other solution, or option is to attack the person who gave it, which is the path that the religious leaders chose. Uh, we're going to move on to the next story, but one last thought. Notice in verse 8, who got the credit when Jesus did the miracle? You know, the stuff that you see on television today the, uh, from people who claim to do miracles, they're always, who, who always gets the, the limelight? Who gets the attention? Jesus never wanted the limelight. He always pointed to his father. He was always glorifying his father. He did all of his miracles with the, by the power of the Holy Spirit and instructions from his father. I would just say be careful of anyone, a preacher or a musician or, or anyone else who, who gladly takes praise that really belongs to God. So Jesus had rattled the cages of these religious leaders by forgiving this man's sin and then, and then having him get up and, and walk away. But what he did next made matters even worse. It's, it's almost like uh, Jesus was in, looking for buttons to push with the scribes and Pharisees, these sore spots. And okay, we got that, but let's, let's, let's push this next one. And in the next one, uh, he... he uh, meets a tax collector. He, he talks about a tax collector named Matthew. Look at that, Matthew chapter 9, verse 9. As Jesus passed on from there, <clears throat> he saw a man called Matthew sitting at the tax booth. 
And he said to him, follow me. And he rose and followed him. Now, this should strike you as kind of odd. Now, what's the name of the gospel we're, we're reading right now? Yes, yeah, it's, it's Matthew. Okay, so Matthew is writing about Matthew. And he's doing it in the, in the third person. Um, interesting. Most of you know that I don't care much for watching television, watch very, very little television. I don't like movies. I think I saw one last year and so far seen one this year. Uh, but, I, but I have really enjoyed a, a, a series. It's kind of a television series called The Chosen. It's a multi-episode show about the life of Jesus. And it's fascinating even to the way it, I've actually watched the background stuff with my wife and, and uh, how it came to be. It didn't come out of Hollywood, which may be one reason I like it. But I just finished watching all of the, the first season of The Chosen. And you can watch it for free. You just get it as an app, The Chosen, on your, on your Android or on your iPhone. The, the uh, characters in this, this series are so well developed. Uh, Nicodemus is, is uh, unbelievably good and uh, really enjoyed uh, watching him. Peter's, Peter is Peter. You know what Peter's like. Peter's wife is, is really spunky. Uh, I, and I swear, everything she says and everything she does, I can hear my wife saying and doing. And, uh, and the tax collector Matthew, is he's a big figure throughout the whole first season, through all these episodes. The tax booth that Matthew mentions here in chapter 9, that tax booth gave him authority to collect personal and business taxes on behalf of the Roman governor. Uh, and of course, you know that Roman, Rome put no limit on how much extra the tax collector could require of people. They had their tax, and then whatever the tax collector could get out of people in addition to that was, was his pay. So tax collectors were known for their dishonesty. They were known for their greed. Uh, and of course, wealthy people could afford to pay off the tax collector, reduce their taxes, get him to falsify the records a little bit. But So lower and, and, and uh, middle income people were the ones that suffered the most because they didn't have the money to, to pay bribes to get out of their taxes and, and the extra fees. Matthew may well have been the most despised person in Capernaum. Because in addition to collecting taxes, the other thing that tax collectors were expected to do was be snitches for the Roman government. They were so hated that devout Jews uh, treated them like they would a dead animal. You know, just, just stay away from that dead animal. Don't touch the animal. Tax collectors could not enter the synagogue. They thought of them as that unclean. They were they were forbidden to give any testimony in court because uh, it was thought that their, anything they said would be completely unreliable. So in the minds of Jews, tax collectors were maybe two inches above pigs, above swine. And it's interesting that Matthew writes very matter-of-factly about himself in this. He says, I was sitting at my tax booth one day. Jesus called me and I followed him. Just like that. He left everything and followed Jesus. No one needed to convince Matthew that he was not a good person inside. He needed a savior. He didn't like who he was, but he didn't know how to, how to change either. I mean, once you get on this career path, how do, you, how do you get out of it? But he believed that Jesus had answers. Almost certainly he had seen or, or heard from people that he trusted about Jesus' miracles. And so Matthew literally walked off the job and he left behind, I think it's Luke that says, he left behind his ledgers, his cash box, his stack of IOUs. He just walked away, which meant that if he ever tried to come back, I don't think he'd get his job back. The Romans would, would certainly not happy with him walking away. But when someone truly meets Christ, they are changed on the inside. And your want to is changed. You don't want to do the things that you did before. Uh, it's not that you have to give up things. People sometimes talk about, well, I have to give up so much to follow Jesus. No, it's not that way at all. It's not giving up. It's giving up things that you want to be glad to be rid of because you gain so much more. Matthew believed that Jesus was his one and, and probably his last chance. Uh, and so when this miracle-working rabbi, who clearly was the real deal, said to Matthew, follow me, 
He did it. And Matthew got two things. He got forgiveness, uh, just like the paralyzed man got his forgiveness, but he also got acceptance by Jesus. And this was huge. Who's going to accept a tax collector who all of a sudden says, well, I've changed. Um, I'm going a different direction now. I'm, I'm, I'm quitting my job and I'm going to start over. Somebody has to give him a break. And the first thing that Matthew does when Jesus gives him that break is he starts telling his tax collector friends about Jesus. He put on a dinner. The dinner was at his house, probably quite a, quite a place. So check out the guest list. Look at verse 10. As Jesus reclined at the table in, in the house, behold, many tax collectors, others, and sinners came and were reclining with Jesus and his disciples. So picture the paparazzi all around Matthew's house. They're all snapping pictures and they're running those pictures to the, to the Jewish religious leaders who were outraged that Jesus, who claimed to be Messiah, claimed for himself the Son of Man title, that he would associate with this kind of people. Uh, how, how could he? I mean, it's not surprising that those kind of people would want to be with Jesus because Jesus was a holy man. But it's, it's shocking that Jesus would intentionally spend time with that kind of people. No religious person was worth their salt would have anything to do with, with any of these people inside at this, at this dinner. Um, I mean, these people were, the, 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 the tax collectors couldn't come to the synagogue. The sinners wouldn't ever choose to darken the door of a synagogue. And here's Jesus and his disciples just talking with them. Verse 11. And when the Pharisees saw this, they said to the disciples, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? Now, if you know anything about Middle Eastern culture, you know that sharing a meal, sharing bread is a very big deal. Uh, you know, we go into a restaurant and, and take a table somewhere and we don't even give a thought to the person or the people, the party that's in the next table. Doesn't matter. It mattered a lot to the Pharisees. They believed that, that eating with irreligious people, sinful people, uh, was to condone their behavior and to actually dirty yourself by their sins. But this is where they missed it. They really missed it. And this is where many Christians miss it today. You don't have to endorse a person's lifestyle or agree with what they say, agree with their social media posts or anything like that, to care about them as a person. Jesus overheard the Pharisees in verse 12. But when he, when he heard it, um, when he heard the Pharisees talking to his disciples, but when he heard it, he said, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. He says, you expect medical professionals to work with sick people, right? So why wouldn't a forgiver like Jesus associate with people who need forgiving? What kind of health professional would, would refuse to spend time with anybody who was not totally healthy? The message for the Pharisees was this. You guys, you guys pride yourselves in diagnosing sin, but you're not interested in helping to cure it. You stop right there with judgment. You want to tell everybody that you want to show the spiritual diseases, but you refuse to offer them God's medicine that he freely offers. You want to call out their sin, but then you just want to turn your back and leave them feeling guilty and, and miserable. I mean, if your tooth hurts, you want to go to someone who can not just identify the problem, but who's willing to get your spit and your blood all over their hands to fix the problem. Religious people who claim wellness and claim righteousness are useless if they maintain physical distance from people who don't know Christ. 
Jesus uses a phrase that would have been very familiar to the scribes and Pharisees. He says, he says go and learn. Go and learn. That, that phrase is kind of a rebuke. Verse 13. Go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. It's, it's a challenge. He's basically saying, hey, figure out what the prophet Hosea meant when he said, I, when God says through Hosea, I desire mercy and not sacrifice. So here's the actual quote. It's God talking. Hebrew, uh, Hosea 6.6. 6. For I desire steadfast love and not sacrifice, the knowledge of God rather than burnt offerings. The fact that Jesus would even choose a passage from Hosea, he could have picked from any of the, any of the prophets, but the fact that he picked from Hosea also made a point, and it actually made it much stronger, because you remember Hosea's wife was repeatedly unfaithful, and yet Hosea kept loving her and, and continued to believe in her. And this is a vivid picture of what God, how God felt toward the people of Israel, who kept failing to follow him and failing to love him, but God's love was unrelenting, unstoppable, now, even when, when the nation was unfaithful to him. So Jesus is saying, basically, you guys are beneficiaries of God's love and compassion, but you refuse to pass it on. Why is that? And why is it that Christians, many times, fail to show compassion? When we, when we don't show compassion, we prove ourselves probably more ungodly than the people that we're, we're condemning because we know better. We're supposed to be like Christ. 1 John chapter 2, verse 6 says, Whoever says he abides in Christ ought to walk in the same way in which he walked. That means not retreating to our safe spaces. It means accepting. It means caring. It means reaching out. It means letting your light shine and realizing that when you do, you will be misunderstood. You will be persecuted by all sides. Do it anyway. Isn't that what Jesus said in the, in the Sermon on the Mount? Look at what he said. Blessed are those who are persecuted for doing right, for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. For so persecuted the prophet, they persecuted the prophets who were before you. So you're in pretty good company. Eric, come on back up and let's uh, sing Jesus, What a Friend of Sinners. Perfect song to follow this message.